reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This evening, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of James, chapter 5. James, chapter 5, show godly concern. We need to be concerned uh, and we need to be careful to get beyond ourselves, to care about others. We need to show concern through generosity. We need to show uh, concern through patience and perseverance. And uh, we need to show concern through praying for other people. And we need to show concern through restoring others to Christ. So we're going to talk about showing godly concern. We need to get beyond ourselves. God wants to meet our needs so we can then be free to reach out to care about the needs of others. It was never God's plan just to meet our needs, period but meet our needs so that we can go out in turn and help others. So let's ask for God's help as we get into his word. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to get beyond ourselves, knowing that as we give our lives to you, you take care of us, and you want us to be concerned about other people, not just us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. James, the half-brother of Jesus, writing in a style very similar to the way Jesus spoke. I'm struck by the similarity of their style of speech or writing and realizing they grew up in the same household. Uh, and while we know about the deity of Jesus Christ, let's not forget about the humanity because James and Jesus had the same mother and uh, James's father was Joseph and uh, that was the stepfather of Jesus, the man who raised him. So they were at the same table uh, learning lessons and growing together and uh, Jude as well, the one who wrote the little book of Jude, uh, also was in the same family, a brother of uh, James and a half-brother of Jesus. Very similar styles. Uh, we are very much like the families we are raised in, and you can see that uh, parallel. Well, let's talk about um, showing concern through generosity. Uh, we need to realize that riches will corrode and uh, that riches will also condemn. Uh, you don't need to have a whole lot of money to become miserly and to become obsessed with wealth. Uh, some poor people are obsessed with wealth, as well as those who are very wealthy. I know wealthy people who are not particularly concerned about money. Uh, you can say, well, they have a lot, but that's just not uh, on their hearts so much as it might be otherwise. In any event, we need to watch out for our attitude because the Bible tells us that there's nothing wrong with riches uh, riches are neutral. Money is neutral. Uh, possessions are neutral. It's what happens in our hearts. And uh, I think it was David who told his son and us that when riches increase, just don't set your heart on them. I find it best to consider myself to be a banker for the Lord. Every dollar that comes in, I'm a banker. It belongs to him. I have a bank up at the corner and I take the deposit on Mondays and uh, they're happy to see me, and we're pleasant, we exchange uh, light conversation, but that money's not theirs. Um, that money's not really mine. Uh, it belongs to the Lord, and it belongs to this fellowship to do the work of the Lord. So we need to take the attitude, it's not mine. When you get a dollar in, well, how much belongs to you? Really, none of it. God says, give me the 10% back, that's the tithe, that belongs to me, it's holy, but also with the 90%, that's mine as well. I realize you're going to have a mortgage or rent or car, upkeep or food or shelter, but come to me and let me show you how to handle all of that. And that's one of the nice things about tithing, not only that it honors God, but it shows our faith and it shows that we are surrendering to him in the area of riches. Riches will not control me. They'll not be my obsession. I'm putting you first, even in the dollar that I receive. Well, let's look now at verses uh, one through three about riches and how they're going to corrode. Come now, you rich. 
Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. He's not talking about people who have a lot of wealth. The idea of rich here is the one who is rich but not towards God. The one who does not take the attitude that I just mentioned about being a banker. The one who says, the wealth is mine. Now the person could have a lot of money and say, it's mine. The person could be on welfare and say, it's mine. And so that attitude of mine is what God's trying to get at and say, don't become rich in and of yourself, but be rich toward me and toward the work that I have for you. You know, Jesus told us to go out into all the world and to share the gospel. And that's one of the ways we should be sharing our wealth, not only in the tithe that we bring to him, but also offerings, alms. Those are the three kinds of giving that we have in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. The tithe, the 10% that belongs to God, and then there's offerings over and above that as the need arises, missionaries and uh, special projects and what have you. And then the alms to the poor, those who are around us who do not have enough to sustain themselves. We should be rich in all three of those areas. But he says now, for those that aren't rich toward God, are not rich toward others, but rich toward themselves. Come now, verse 1, you rich Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. God is going to deal with them because he has given them special and precious resources and they have used it for themselves. It's interesting in the area of the tithe how God closes out the Old Testament in talking about the fact that Israel had not been faithful in the area of the tithe as he had commanded. And what does he say about the tithe when you and I get our hands on God's tithe? He calls it robbery. Ooh, Malachi chapter 3 verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. Now you and I don't want to rob anybody. I don't want to do the time. And can you imagine if you were caught robbing? Well, God says when you keep that tithe back, that's robbing. Well, yet a man's going to be robbing me. And you say, in what way have we robbed you? And he says, in tithes and offerings. Don't forget the offerings. He says, you are cursed with a curse. Why? Because you have what's mine. And he goes on to say, you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And then he gives you the solution. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. In other words, the house can operate. And try me now in this. The only place in the Bible where he says, try me or test me. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not, number one, open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it unbelievable outpouring of God's blessing. People say, well, that doesn't necessarily mean money, but it can be health and it can be good relationships. Yes, all of that's true, but we're talking about sowing and reaping. I put grass seed in the ground. What do I expect? Grass. I plant corn in the garden. I expect corn. I expect as I bring the tithe into the storehouse, there'll be a financial blessing that I cannot contain. And number two, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Oh, the devil wants to get his hands on our field, doesn't he? He will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in, this, in the field. And then number three, everyone's going to notice your life of blessing. He says, all nations will call you blessed. You'll be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Well, that's the attitude we should have. Put God first in your finances, and this passage will not apply. On the other hand, the one who is rich toward himself. And again, it doesn't mean a multi-billionaire or a millionaire. It can be somebody uh, on Social Security, somebody in poverty, who is saying it's mine, and that person is possessive of what God has given that individual. And so he says, there's going to be a payday, and uh, you're going to have to 
find that you're going to weep and howl because you're going to become accountable for how you spent the money God gave you. When you and I get to heaven, there's going to be an accounting. There's going to be a judgment seat. How did you spend the money that I gave you? How did you spend the time that I gave you? How did you spend the gifts and the resources and the family and on and on? What did you do with it? Verse 2, he says, your riches are corrupted. Uh, in other words, they have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Now, in those days, they didn't have a bank. They didn't have credit cards. They didn't have the financial means that we have today. You had your wealth in your clothing and in your gold and your silver and in your produce. Uh, the tithes that were brought to the storehouse in the Old Testament had to have rooms for produce, for grapes and for corn and for wheat and for gold and silver and animals. On and on it went. Well, in those days, uh, your riches would be corrupted and uh, your garments moth-eaten. Oh, you'd have very fancy garments, but moths love to eat fancy garments, don't they? And uh, you'd have uh, certain riches, but they would corrupt. They would, uh, you might have gold and silver, it becomes tarnished, uh, and it becomes corroded, uh, certain possessions you have. Well, what about today? Today, you have your money in the bank or in an investment advisor's office, and what kind of a return are you getting on your money? You are lucky to get 1%. Not even that. And the only thing that is sure is inflation. Return on your investment is not there, but inflation is. And so what's happening is if you put your money in the mattress, you're doing just about as well as you do with investing in a CD or something else. But what's happening to inflation? It's higher than that. Your money is becoming diminished day by day. And the old saying is true, you can't take it with you but you can send it on ahead. And so responsible giving uh, is a way of sending it on ahead. Whatever money you give to the Lord's work, the tithes, the offerings, the alms, that is going to be to your credit when you get to heaven. You'll be rewarded for having used that, and you'll be given a position in the millennium which will reflect your faithfulness here. You and I will be back here on earth in the millennium with the Lord having different jobs, and the faithfulness we have exhibited now will then be carried out at that time. Well, verse 3, he says, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. God is going to judge us for how we have handled his finances. Yeah, but I work. I work six hours a day, four hours a day, eight hours a day. Yeah, and Moses tells us who's the one who gave you the ability to go to work. Yeah, but that silver is mine, that gold is mine, that, that greenback is mine. No, the Bible tells us clearly, God says the gold and the silver are mine. We are simply bankers. Those dear folks, we got three banks up at the corner there. I just counted the other day. Three, three banks on one little corner. And um, how much of that money is theirs? None of it. They're there, so they're just custodians. And God says, this money is not yours. You're only a custodian for what I give you. Well, verse 4, so many times the people who are exceedingly wealthy have done it through dishonest means. Not always, to be sure. There are people who are very wealthy who have been very honest. But there are many who have been dishonest and they have taken advantage of other people. Look at verse 4. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. So you had workers working for you in your field and you didn't pay them or you didn't pay them on time or you didn't pay them what they were worth. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Now that means actually the Lord of hosts, God himself. Talk about how mighty God is. He is the God of hosts, of the heavenly hosts of the angels and of those who are saved and redeemed in heaven. And so he is the one who hears these cries, and you and I need to be careful about how we treat people. I've heard stories about ministers and churches who have uh, called for services of electrical or plumbing nature or what have you, and don't pay their bills on time, or don't pay their bills at all. And that's a lousy testimony for the Lord. That's a lousy testimony for the cause of Christ. We always make sure that our bill is paid immediately. I don't let it sit on my desk even for a day. It honors God to pay it on time 
And to be very practical, if you're like me, when there's a problem with the plumbing, when there's a problem with the heating, when would I like them to come? In a week? Two weeks? Hey, the, uh, the toilet's overflowing. Take your time. Come in a month. No, I want them to come as soon as possible. Heat's not working. It's minus uh, 10 degrees uh, outside. When do I want them to come? In a week? I want them to come tonight, tomorrow. Well, when you pay your bills on time, guess what? They come as soon as they can. I've never had anybody that I was aware of try to hold me up when I needed help. They come as soon as they can. Why? A, it's the right thing to do. B, it's their reputation. C, they get paid right away. There is a causal relationship I've learned over many, many years in business and in ministry. There is in almost a direct proportion. If I take 30 days to pay a bill, I will get service, maybe not exactly in 30 days, but I will not get it quickly. If I get that check in the mail the very next day to them, and I make a phone call that I want service, it's like that. It never fails. And so it is with relationships. We need to be realizing the sowing and reaping, even with people that you work with. Um, there are people out there who try to stiff you. They try to... Uh, uh, take advantage of you, and it's not right. And some ministries have done that. And again, it's a very poor witness for the Lord. Well, he says in verse 5, these who are wealthy, not wealthy in general, but wealthy toward themselves instead of God, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. And so they are taking care of their own pleasures instead of the work of the Lord. They're flying around in expensive planes and great limousines and what have you. And uh, when you see somebody in ministry doing it, it's particularly noteworthy and particularly uh, repugnant. Uh, there are always stories about some of the big ministries, not all to be sure, but some of the big ministries that perhaps are a little bit too lavish in their lifestyle and it gives a very, very poor image of ministry. Uh, again, needs should be met and we shouldn't have to walk everywhere. But on the other hand, we should be modest and uh, not always uh, trying to get the best seat for ourselves or the best position for ourselves. God says, you have condemned and you have murdered the just. and He does not resist you. So the wealthy, in some cases, have condemned and murdered the just. Perhaps they haven't killed them, or maybe they have. Perhaps they've killed them in a business deal. Wealthy people sometimes will take advantage of the poor. Big multi-billion dollar companies can come in and roll over small independent business people and say, you don't like it? Take me to court. And oh, meet my 100 lawyer law firm who will hold you up for the rest of your lives while you scrape together a little lawyer's fee. Sometimes the wealthy will use the courts to their advantage and there are many ways to do it. As a lawyer, I can tell you, I've been down that road and uh, you can hang somebody up for years in court with enough money and clever lawyers and grind the little guy down so he can't possibly have a chance to make it. And there are examples of that all over. And uh, God says, I'm watching. I am watching how you treat people and I want you to be concerned for them. So we should show our concern for others with generosity, uh, to be meeting their needs, helping them wherever possible, not just being selfish. Because in the story of that man that was building bigger barns, remember him? Jesus said he had all his wealth in, in uh, agricultural produce and uh, he had so much, he had to build a bigger barn and then a big, bigger barn. And the Lord said, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. You won't even see tomorrow. All right, so we are generous towards others. Lord, how can I meet the needs of other people? Now, I want to say on the, on the flip side of that, when you're meeting the needs of other people, and I've made a lot of mistakes in this area, and so have others. You come in and you want to just do all that you can to help. And there are people on the other end who know that and they become professional users. And uh, they're lazy and they don't want to go out and earn a living and they don't want to take care of themselves and they know how to put the pressure on. They know you're a Christian. They know you have this message about generosity and they take advantage of you. There's also that side of the story. What do you do? You don't just simply reach into your pocket. You pray. 
wisdom, Lord, is this of you? Is this cause for you? Now, the tithe, is that's a no-brainer. That goes into your storehouse, your local church, to meet the needs of that church. But what about an offering? Somebody comes and wants to, uh, to have an offering uh, uh, given to that person. Pray about it. And you know, here's some, something I've had to learn the hard way. Probably, if it's 7 o'clock at night when the demand is placed upon you or the request, I'll get back to you in the morning. I'll get back to you in a couple of days. I'm going to pray. The person's not going to die in the meanwhile. Pray about it and say, Lord, confirm it. If the person wants a lot of money, I want a big confirmation, Lord, and a personal appearance from Jesus there. But it's very, very poor to make a snap judgment. One of the members of our church had moved on in his life and um, had been a millionaire, but things were starting to go bad, and he was making foolish decisions. An evangelist was asking for some money for some needs. It was in another country, and he um, said, the Lord just spoke to me to give, uh, I think the figure was $100,000. And he didn't have the money, so he turned to a local pastor and said, write a check for $100,000. The pastor didn't have the money, but the young fellow said, I will pay you tomorrow. The pastor wrote the check for $100,000 on an account that didn't have that money. The next day, the young fellow did not pay the pastor. He said, oh, God told me he's changed his mind, and I shouldn't do that. Now, the pastor was out $100,000, and he had to sell his assets, personal assets and family assets, to cover that debt. That's sloppy. That's poor. So take your time. If somebody puts a, a demand on you and doesn't, uh, doesn't feel quite right, pray about it. Even if it feels right, pray about it. Believe me, sleep on it. My grandfather used to say, sleep on it and see what tomorrow brings. And if it's still strong tomorrow or the day after, and you can afford to as the Lord leads, then you do it with the blessings of the Lord Jesus. So uh, be generous, but don't be foolish. Secondly, we need to show concern for others through patience, and perseverance. And there's a difference, and I think it's important for us to realize that difference. Um, let's look at verses 7 through 12. He says, be patient. Verses 7 to 10. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand, or it has drawn near. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. So that's the first admonition in this section. Be patient. Secondly, he says, you need to persevere. Verses 11 and 12. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Patience and perseverance are very, very different. We should have both. But if you're like me, you may suffer in one of those areas or both. Don't give up. Keep trying. God's not finished with us yet. Let's talk about patience. Patience is the, an attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. That means you're waiting upon the Lord. You're not complaining. Uh, let's look at it more uh, closely. Verse 7. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. How long do you, are you going to be patient? Wait upon the Lord until He comes. Either He comes to take you home, or He comes in the air to call us all up to uh, be part of His kingdom. And anyway, use the example of the farmer. Um, now, some of you, how many of you are farmers? You ever plant, uh, my wife loves to, uh, to uh, plant uh, corn and tomatoes and broccoli and this and that. She understands uh, quite a bit about agriculture. We all plant seed. You've all grass, done grass seed. And you understand there's a process. 
and you till the soil and you uh, plant the seed and you water it or God waters it uh, from the heavens and in time you're going to produce fruit or God will. You don't get anxious. You plant it in the springtime and you don't two weeks later say, where's my corn? Where are my tomatoes? You know it's going to take time. Well, God's going to take time as well with us, isn't he? And so we are waiting upon the Lord. We're asking for wisdom and direction, provision. And we know he hears us, but it takes time. We need to be patient. Wait on the Lord, he tells us again and again. Well, he says, wait patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. Again, going back to the agriculture, there needs to be rain. In that that area of uh, Israel, there was an, an early rain and a latter rain, which was very important for the produce to grow. So we do the same thing here. We wait for the rain, and in due time, the, pro, the produce, the crop, will come forth. Verse 8, he says, Now you also be patient. Wait. Wait. Be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand, or it has drawn near. So you need to be patient. You need to wait upon him, and you need to establish your heart. Uh, waiting's not easy, is it? The Lord in 1983 gave me a sevenfold prophecy when I was down in the island of St. Martin and I was worshiping the Lord one night. I was worshiping for about, oh, an hour in tongues, just worshiping in song and in word. And the Lord gave me a sevenfold prophecy. And uh, in that prophecy, there are seven parts to it. And the first five parts uh, were rather near term. And they would come to pass really within about four months. The first part meant as soon as you go back to Albany, New York, sell your law practice. I thought, what? I'm 40 years of age. I'm in a very prominent law firm. I'm making more money than I deserve. What is going on? The second part was you'll work with your mother and your father in ministry. That was part two and three and two other fellows as well. You're going to establish a teaching ministry. That was in March, I think it was, of 83. It was all done by July all fulfilled. Part six, you will have a teaching ministry. It'll reach around the world. Part seven, in the fullness of time, I will bring you a wife and she will be all that you could ever need or desire. Well, the first five parts, as I say, took place in a couple of months. Started a little work here in Albany, New York. It started off small, got a little bit bigger, got a little bit smaller, never did get very large by mega church standards, but a faithful work we trust by the grace of God. But year one, two, 10, 15, 20, 25 came along, 27. Where was the worldwide ministry? Where was the wife? Got up to about year 28, 29, suddenly the ministry started to explode through the internet. Not through the walls of this building, but through the internet. And now, uh, 35 years later, uh, we are in most of the nations of the world, being viewed in, I think, 157 nations out of the 197. 73% of the nations have been viewing us uh, through the internet. But then what about that seventh part? Hint, when God tells you the fullness of time, honey, that's not going to be tomorrow <laughs> or the day after. Fullness of time. And God is the one who stands outside of time. 31 years I waited. And then suddenly she, the woman of God, came. I said, God, I'm not going to go to the, the watering holes and I'm not going to go to the dances or the youth groups. My Lord, I'm 70, 71 years of age. I'm not going to go play volleyball and wrench my back over some uh, attempt to find my wife. You bring her to me. I'm too lazy. I'll open the doors to the church. She'll walk in. Don't you know she did? Three and a half years ago, she and her son Lenny, they're both here tonight. They walked in at a Thursday night service, and that was it. The Lord said, she's the one. So my advice to everybody here is wait 71 years to get married. And everybody, and John, the same thing for John. He waited 71 years, and I can't get any takers. I can't get anybody who says, hey, I'm all for that. They, they, they want to have it sooner. Well, I'm hoping it's going to be sooner for you. But whether it's 71 years or 31 years or whatever it is, wait patiently. God has a time. God has a time. I could have jumped earlier. There were many opportunities uh, to go ahead and fulfill the promise. Abraham and Sarah 
had the chance to wait patiently for God. They did not. They jumped. And oh, the mess that happened then and even to this day as they went ahead and had a child who was not the child of promise. Then the child of promise came. And the warfare we have today with the Palestinians and the Israelis is abundant testimony and always will be until the coming of the Lord that you don't move too quickly. Wait on the Lord. Well, he says, you be patient and establish your hearts, verse 8. Get your heart established. I'm going to wait for the Lord and his timing. I want God's best. I don't want some kind of a quick solution. I want the best. The coming of the Lord is at hand. The coming of the Lord to return, to take us to his kingdom or take us uh, uh, in the rapture uh, or just he's at hand right now to meet our needs daily. He's right there to meet our needs. Don't grumble against one another, verse 9. You know, as we get impatient, we grumble. Have you ever noticed that? You get, uh, you get impatient. You're traveling on a vacation with the family in the car, and it's getting hot, and the, the road is long, and you're getting uh, frustrated. You start to get testy. You start to get grumbly. And uh, whatever the situation is, when you and I are impatient, we tend to grumble. We tend to complain, and we must not do that. We tend to groan against one another. He says, uh, you'll be condemned for it. God's going to hold you responsible for how you treat someone. So behold, the judge is standing at the door. God is there. The other morning I came on out and uh, uh, my wife is there and one of the kids comes and is as cross as uh, two sticks. And I thought, what is going on? I never did find out what the problem was, but here's a nice day, ready to start the day. My wife was in a happy mood and this child was just... Rah, 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 rah. Just as, as ugly as could be. Well, I've learned uh, patiently to keep my head low and just be quiet and go about my duties. But um, that kind of grumbling, uh, it was because of an evidence of impatience. That child was impatient about something. Uh, we all tend to get impatient at times. And we must not uh, grumble against each other, must not groan. Uh, the judge is at the door. The Lord is ready to come at any moment. If he came at this moment, how would I feel? Here I am, impatient, complaining to somebody, and, oh, hi, Jesus. Is this the time to go up on the rapture now? Well, that's wonderful. Uh, that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Well, he goes on to say now in um, verse 10, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. You want an example? Look at the life of Isaiah. Look at the life of Jeremiah. We were studying him recently on Sundays. Oh, he was, had a prophecy ministry for 40 years. And how many converts did he have? Zero. Ezekiel, uh, a prophecy ministry in Babylon uh, for a number of years. How many converts? Zero. They were patient. They still did their work. And uh, with this ministry, I expected it might blow the walls out to become a mega church and, and uh, you know, thousands upon thousands. But God never said that for us. He said, the word will go around the world. Never even, never had a computer back in those days. When I had that word in 83, no one had laptops as they do now. And never, never heard of YouTube and all those kinds of things. But when God makes a promise, he'll fulfill it. How he'll do it, we don't know. Just be patient and wait upon him. And you might have to suffer. Notice the example of suffering and patience. Sometimes patience includes suffering. Lord, help me to be able to suffer if it's from your hand. If it's the devil or my own foolishness, then get out and grow up. But if it's God who's allowing this suffering, then we need to be patient, knowing that he will bring us through it at the right time. Now that's patience. And I find verses 11 and 12 very encouraging because, to be honest with you, I'm not always very patient. Are you? I'm not the most patient person out there. Well, let's look at an example of somebody who was not patient, but was persevering. Verse 11, indeed, we count them blessed who endure. Now we're changing from patience to perseverance. Patience means you don't complain, you're calm, you're trusting in God. Everything's okay, God's going to take care of it. But to be honest, that's not always our heart. Well, then we need to kick into perseverance. In other words, maybe you're complaining, you need to repent of it, you need to ask God's forgiveness, but you endure, you keep hanging in there. Verse 11, we count them 
blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. I'm glad for that translation, which is proper here in the New King James. I think another translation has it as the patience of Job. You ever heard of that? And I would be, I would be saying, what do you mean patience? Every page he's complaining. Every page he says, I want to die. Hey, any guy who says, curse the day that I was born, who is complaining to God, complaining to his friends, complaining about his, and I understand what he's going through. I haven't gone through it as bad as he has, but God bless him, he was going through a lot of agony. He was not patient because he was complaining, but he persevered. That's the right word. He persevered. You have heard of the perseverance of Job. So if you flunk the test of patience the way I do at times, don't flunk the test of perseverance. All right? You complained. That's not patient. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, wife. Forgive me, others, for complaining. But I am still hanging in. You get up the next day. The devil knocked your teeth out the night before. You put your false teeth back in, and you just keep on going. When I was very young, I had a friend who, I forgot his name, but he was a clown. He was a balloon clown. You've all seen them. He was weighted on the bottom, and I would pound his face, and he would go down and come back up again. Did you have one of those guys, too? You pound him, and he'd go down and come back up again. So that little guy was a picture of perseverance. Just couldn't keep him down. And that's the way it is with Christians. You might be knocked down, but you don't stay down. You get right back up. And so Job, even though he wasn't patient, oh, he was a complainer, and I would be too in his circumstances, but he was persevering. He did hang in there. And God was able to then give his intended end. He saw the intended end by the Lord. Look at the intended end. What happened to him at the end? God blessed him double, gave him double all that he had before. New kids, great wealth, same wife, <laughs> and uh, the one who said, curse God and die. But uh, he, had, he was blessed twice as much as before when he prayed for his friends. He hung in there. So be patient. If you can't be patient, at least be persevering and hang in there. That the Lord is very compassionate. He's merciful. He is going to meet your needs. He'll be compassionate about your situation. And he'll be merciful. Now, above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. So when you and I get frustrated, we get impatient, or we have trouble in persevering, sometimes we want to, um, the word swear here does not mean you say bad words. That's not the, what the, what the, what the idea of swearing is, you're not telling the truth. We tend to lie as we get impatient or we are not persevering. We tend to lie. We tend to exaggerate. We tend to not tell the truth uh, at times, and we need to tell the truth. Uh, their idea of swearing was crazy, incidentally. Um, they would say, for example, here, I swear to you by the temple in Jerusalem that what I'm telling you is the truth. Then I go out and I lie. But Jerry, you said you swore by the temple. Huh, I did, but I didn't say I swear by the gold in the temple. So we have an example today. You know, I say to you, I'm telling you the truth, and my hand is behind my back and my fingers are crossed, meaning that I'm not really telling you the truth. He says, no, be honest. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. He's not talking, incidentally, some Christians have said, I won't go to court and put my hand on the Bible and raise my hand and say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. That's not what he's talking about here. And so the court requires that, go ahead and do it and don't worry about it. But uh, let your yes be yes, no, no, be honest is what he's saying. All right, we're showing our concern through generosity. We see here we're showing concern for others through patience and perseverance. Ah, how about prayer? Verses 13 to 18, we should be caring about others, praying for them, and also praying with confidence that God is going to hear us. Verses 13 to 16, the first part, let's pray for others. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. So you come together, and if you're suffering, uh, pray. 
Uh, are you cheerful? Then sing a psalm. Sing a song. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. That's, uh, you know, there are many different ways of being healed in the Bible. Always through Jesus, of course, but there are anointed uh, cloths, there's uh, anointed oil, it's the elders, the uh, fellowship of believers, many different ways to be healed. One of the ways is the elders. Now, the elders are available before and after a service. Call on the elders of the church. If you're not sure who they are, let me know, and I'll let you know uh, who they are. We'll, we'll gather them over there. They'll anoint with oil. God is saying that is one effective way to be healed. So if you're sick, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Oil representing the power of the Holy Spirit, the commissioning of God. Now, today... With modern technology, you can come on into the church and the elders can pray for you. You can pick up the telephone and talk to me. and uh, We can get several elders on the phone, uh, patching them in. But one of the most effective ways we now do it is through texting. Uh, all of the elders in the church here have uh, smartphones. And when somebody asks me to pray, I pray with that individual and I then text the elders to pray and the elders are taking it. They get back to me within a matter of minutes. That's uh, any time, any day. So uh, we have wonderful ways to do it. Take advantage of the elders. Uh, I've told people who go to supposedly dead churches where the elders don't know about these, I said, take this scripture to them, take some oil, and say to the elder or the trustee of the church, whatever you believe, you believe, but the Bible says this, anoint me with oil and pray. And if that person believes in healing and the elder does not, guess what? You'll still be healed. Even though the elder doesn't have the faith, you have the faith. And faith is what God's looking for. So the prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up, means out of that bed of sickness. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. So go to the elders. Ask them to anoint with oil Pray the prayer of faith. Text me. I'll text them. Whatever method we need, let's get the elders uh, moving. It's a very powerful way for the work of God to be done. Now he says here in verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's another way, of course, to be healed. Not only the elders, but you confess your trespasses to one another and you pray for one another that you may be healed. Uh, again, a little bit of caution. You don't just go to the whole church necessarily and say, I'm struggling with the addiction of so-and-so, unless you're ready to publicize it. Uh, but go to some faithful friends that you can trust and confess and say, I need your help. Uh, I'm standing for victory and I'm not getting it. I need to have someone help me, lift my arms with me, stand with me. And so you go to each other, you pray for each other, and that's another way to be healed. Uh, as, as, in addition to the elders. And then as far as the fact that, ooh, I'm not an elder, is God going to hear me? Hey, God hears anyone who comes in faith in the name of Jesus. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. When you and I pray effectively and fervently, it means we're absolutely sincere um, in our supplication, and we are righteous, not because we are perfect, but because Jesus is righteous. We come in his name. That avails much. And then he gives you an example. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Just in other words, a human being. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. That was during the time of the wicked king Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And God was trying to punish the land because they were worshiping Baal. And God wanted to show that he was God. Baal was not. God could provide rain. Baal could not. And so Elijah prayed for it not to rain for three and a half years to get the attention of the people. And then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. God said, go ahead and pray. And it did. And he said to King Ahab, move out quickly, it's going to rain. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. So he was an ordinary man. Oh, I'm not Elijah. No, you're not. But you know, Elijah didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling him. 
He had the Holy Spirit come upon him for that occasion. But in the New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit in us. And so you and I have that kind of power because we come in the name of Jesus. And then he says, finally, show concern not only through generosity, through patience, through perseverance, through prayer, but through restoration. Think about others and restoring them. Restore the sinner and save the sinner. Verse 19, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So bring back the one who is erring, the one who has gone away, the prodigal son. So brethren, if anyone among you is wandering from the truth, so you've got somebody in your family, some friend who's wandering from the truth, and uh, not even deliberately going away from the truth, but just wandering and meandering and going further and further away, and someone turns him back. If, if that somebody comes along and turns that person back, let him know that he who turns the sinner from the error of his way, he's going to save that soul uh, from death. That means separation from God. And it's going to cover a multitude of sins because of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe there's somebody in our family that we can reach. Maybe in some cases we cannot reach that member because the door is closed for one reason or another. Pray that somebody else will reach that individual. Somebody else will be able to share the faith. I have a situation of a sibling of mine who has resisted uh, the Lord for over 70 years <laughs> in our family. But God has been gracious enough to bring into her life another believer through her son marrying a believer. And uh, that uh, the daughter-in-law has a mother who is on fire from the Lord like you can't believe. So my sister is hearing it from that side as well as my side. And God knows who else he was going to put in her way. But let's pray that somebody will be there to turn away my uh, prodigal son, daughter, husband, whatever it might be. Um, care about others. So those are the ways we show godly concern, according to James. Uh, in your outline, um, the lesson, I think, for this chapter is believers show the life of Christ through their concern for others. If you say, I love Jesus, but you have no care about anybody else, uh, that's not true faith, because Jesus cares about others. And if Jesus lives inside of us, we care about others. So I've got some scriptures there. You can read them on your own. And for those watching by YouTube or television, um, you can go on our website, reachoutfellowship.org, reachoutfellowship.com. Click on James 5, and you'll see these scriptures there. There's some scriptures on riches, caring for the poor, and how to use riches properly. There are scriptures on patience and perseverance how not to grow weary, and how to pray for others. There are scriptures on oaths, not to swear an oath, and don't be dishonest. And then scriptures on prayer, how to pray for healing, and those prayers are recorded and saved in heaven. So a lot of wonderful scriptures here, a lot of good word about showing godly concern. Now, what is going to keep us from godly concern? Self self. I can't see anybody else. All I can see is me, my needs. I've noticed in this wonderful family that I've married into with, with a wonderful wife and lots of kids and lots of animals and all that uh, I do well when I take a heart of concern for the family. I do not do well when I think about Jerry and Jerry's not getting a fair shake and Jerry this and Jerry that. That's when I start to go south. My attitude gets bad and my wife has to come along and dress me down and, and pick me back up and get me in the right direction. Think about Jesus. Think about others. And um, think about yourself last. That's the best way to do it. Jesus first, others second, self last. In fact, get so caught up in Jesus, get so caught up in others that you forget about self and that's when the blessings really come because the Lord will not forget about you. He'll meet your needs. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this chance to have studied James chapter 5. I've enjoyed this book of James. Really practical. It's a favorite of so many people. And Lord, we ask you to help us to show godly concern for others. Help us to be generous. Yes, bring our tithe into the storehouse and offerings and meet needs for the poor as you would open up opportunities for us. Help us to show patience without grumbling and groaning. But even if we get impatient, help us to quickly confess it 
and help us always to endure, never to give up, keep bouncing back like my old friend the clown that I kept popping down and he kept popping back up again. Lord, help us to show concern through prayer for others and how to pray with confidence that you are hearing us and you will answer our prayers. And then let's show concern for those who are prodigal sons and daughters who are wandering away. If we can help to restore them, Lord, open up the door of opportunity. If the door is closed to us, bring someone else along the path to take care of it. Lord, we love you. Help us to show our love for you and our concern for others. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. moment your needs to supply